Hello and welcome to our new Insight Seren talk today. Yeah. Hi. Joining us here is Leanne Davy. She is globally well known for her work in leadership expert and teamwork. So hello, Leanne. Hello. Hi, Vivian. Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate so much that you can spend your morning time with us today, and we I'm are very so excited. excited. Yeah, yeah, we we are excited too to hear more and learn more from you, your work. So um, just to kick it off, would you please share it uh, share with us a bit about yourself and maybe your currently uh, your work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's so nice to meet you both. Um, so a bit about me. Well, I guess first of all, let me place myself on the globe. So I am in Toronto, Canada. So that's where I sit in the world, and I've lived here my whole life. Although I spend a lot of time traveling around the world to enjoy this big, beautiful globe we live on. Uh, by background, I studied organizational psychology, and for the last 25 years, I've been working in a variety of different ways to. Help people achieve amazing things together. So that's my strategy: is the psychology of teamwork and collaboration. And today, my husband and I have our own small firm where we where we do exactly that. We work with executive teams to help them lead their businesses and achieve amazing things. <laughs> Thank you so much for for sharing your. Um, your, you know, your life in the nutshell is very short in about two minutes. So allow yeah. Vivian and I to do enough topsy of you know your your career journey, and then we're gonna bring you from <laughs> from time to time in your uh, you know um, you know from the beginning, all right? So we will start with the Leanne at the very early stage of your life. Okay. So we're gonna bring you to maybe when you were five, six, seven years old, and. Uh, I would like to uh, to know back then when you was a little girl. What did you dream one day you're gonna become, Dolia? That's interesting. I don't. I don't so much remember dreaming about what I was gonna become, but I know what I loved when I was a little girl, mm. which was factories. Factory. I was so fascinated. By how factories work, and so there was a television program for little kids that I watched, and uh, it, it was you know a, a half an hour show, but they always had this little section in the show where they would go to a factory and they would show you how they make crayons or how they make Q-tips or how, you know that sort of thing. And I loved it. I'd be like right up by the television. Of course, it was the 1970s, so it was those like big box televisions. I'd be right up by the television. And it's interesting because you know I'm still at 50 years old. I'm still fascinated by factories, and I try to get into factories to see how they work whenever I can. And I think that's what first got me interested in business and organizations. Was I came in through loving industrial design and that sort of thing so uh, you know when I got older that just changed to still being interested in business but instead of the machines made of metal I was interested in teams as kind of the human machines because our economy changed from a manufacturing economy here in North America mm. to a, a knowledge economy mm. so the, the machines are now in here mm. so I think I'm still fascinated by Business and machines, but uh, it's just more of these kinds of machines, human machines now. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like for me to um, link a little bit from from your love to from the engineering process, yeah. effective, efficient, and and convert it to a human for team to be effective exactly. and efficient as well. Um, one thing I really like when 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 I see your your book is like you first. The first book, yeah, yeah, I yeah. think the first book in twenty. That's the first one, yeah. Yeah, it's like I love the term like grow up, get along, and get stuff done. <laughs> you know, like you're talking to a big version of people, but a childhood kind of thing. Yeah, it's yes, so I, when I wrote that book, people often ask, you know, why did you write a book about teams and call it you first? It doesn't sound like a book about teams, mm. and it's because. I often find the problem on teams is every individual is waiting for somebody else to change, or mm. or they're blaming everyone else. Uh -huh. 
And the only person who's likely going to change your team is you. You go first and others will follow. So when I got the title, then I was looking for what was a subtitle that really expressed how I sometimes felt, you know, come on, you can do it. And and so inspire your team to grow up, get along and get stuff done just came to me. And uh, it's funny because the book is almost 10 years old, which is crazy. And I still love that subtitle. <laughs> so I guess I named it. I named it well. <laughs> wow, you did. <laughs> and Leanne. Uh, we we want to con I, and you know Vivian okay, will jump here and there with her uh, questions and I will continue with the with the path of your uh, growing up okay uh, so yeah. you know when you had a fascination you know uh, in, uh, you like industrial when you're young factory when you're young and then you move on to you know university learning about industrial and and psychology so why did you choose psychology back then if you in can you share with us? Okay, you want the true story? <laughs> yes, we would want to hear the true story. I, it's, a, it, it's a sad story with a happy ending, I'll tell you how. So uh, I took all science mm. in first year university, physics mm. and chemistry and biology and calculus. <laughs> and I failed calculus. Like I didn't just a little bit fail calculus. I fully failed <laughs> and because of that at my university every single student needed to have a math course and so i needed to take it again the next year mm. but because i didn't have it there were many courses i couldn't take mm. so i was looking for courses that i was able to take i had enjoyed psychology in first year mm. and i saw a course that didn't have any requirements called industrial organizational psychology mm. and i thought <laughs> I'll, I'll try it while I go back and take calculus again. And uh, I loved every minute of it from the very first time, I guess that was 1990. Mm. That's terrifying, 32 years I've been in this field. 1990 that I took that class and we studied the team that was the engineers on the space shuttle Challenger and all the decisions they had made that led to the explosion of the space shuttle and all of the team dynamics that allowed them to, to let that space shuttle go into space, knowing that there was this very big risk. And then I was just, oh, I was hooked. <laughs> I, was, I was, this is, this is it for me. I, I'm in. Um, and so that was really, uh, I, I took that one course and then I took every other course in industrial organizational psychology I could find. And then I took a master's degree in it and then I did a PhD. In it. And here I am 32 years later, still thinking that it's the most exciting field that there is. So, yep, that's, I just, I, f I fell in love with it. Mm. But then there's a lot of uh, topics in organizational psychology or industrial organization psychology. But then you focus, yeah. you drill in into a, being an expert in an area of teamwork and for humans yeah. working as a team. Why? Well, I think it's back to that machine idea. Ah. Um, so uh, I like complexity. Mm. And uh, so I think that's why I love these factories as a kid. It was like, how do these machines know how to like put a label on and put a lid on and package? Like, I just love that complexity and, and working with so many industrial psychologists work with individuals. They they understand how the individual works. They assess how much how well suited they are for a job, all of those things. Mm -hmm. I was more interested in when it gets really messy. So if you go back to the Space Shuttle Challenger example, there were people who knew there were individuals who knew mm -hmm. uh, the risk of the O-rings in the cold temperatures, which is what ultimately uh, caused the explosion. But why did those people, when surrounded by certain other people, why did they not fight? Why did they not say no? Um, so I was much more interested in 
that complex dynamic that happens. So needing to understand how individuals work, but then also needing to understand, you know, how does that work when you've got many people together and you've got the culture and the values and the all of the social dynamics, even talking about it gets me all excited. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so you like, you like to do all the challenge, you like to do all the hard works to, uh, to learn, to study. But then, and, and back then, did you realize that, do you ever dream of, or thought of one day you're going to travel the world and then teaching people about teamwork, about how, how we work in together, contribute together? Do you? <laughs> No, of course not. <laughs> so, no, so, did I ever think? Yeah, go ahead. So, so what did you think that, you know, if you finish the bachelor degree, then finish the master degree, then finish the PhD degree, and that is about eight or 10 years of your life, right? Yeah, focusing on yeah, years, industrial yeah. <laughs> organization psychology. And then what did you think one day, you know, finish all of that and you would become Lien? Yeah, so that I can answer very clearly. Yeah. I thought I was going to become a professor ah. and I I had a job offer to mm. become a professor. Mm. Um, and right before I needed to sign back my contract, uh, a friend phoned me and mm. she said, I hadn't talked to her in two years and she had been working in Toronto um, and she was interviewing at a company and the company was called Watson Wyatt. It was a big global human resources consulting firm. Mm. And it's now part of Willis Towers, Watson, Watson yeah. all these mergers happen. Um, but at the time it was Watson Wyatt. And she said, you know what? The company wasn't a good fit for me, but the whole time I was sitting in my interviews, I was thinking of you. I thought this would be a great place for you. And I said, me, I, I don't want to be a consultant. I'm going to be a professor. And she's like, okay, whatever. I just thought, I just thought I'd tell you. And uh -huh. some little part of me was like, hmm, <laughs> should I give it a try? And so I went and I spoke with them and it was a whirlwind process. Mm -hmm. And at some point I was having lunch with the, the partner, the most important person who had to make the call. And 24 hours later, my contract to the university was due and so I said to them, look, I need a contract mm. within 24 hours if, if you want me to do this. And they looked at each other and they said, we'll have it to you by 9 a.m. tomorrow. Wow. And my whole life just went, whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I knew for sure I was going to be a professor. Uh. For sure. A hundred percent I was going to be a professor. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> yeah. And then... Crazy. What's going, what went on after that? Can you continue sharing with us yeah. the journey after? Absolutely. So what I learned when I got that first job was that we all have currency mm. in the world. And what you want to do when looking for a job is to find a place where they take your currency, where it's valuable to them, mm. but you can use it to buy something you want. So in my PhD program, I had been a very nerdy um, numbers person, lots of quantitative, lots of statistics, many, many, many different projects where I worked with complex statistics. And at that time, 1998, um, employee engagement surveys were really hot. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of data analysis and that sort of thing. So I knew that my strong measurement would buy me a spot in a company mm. but what i wanted was to buy access to leaders mm. i didn't want to do number stuff behind the scenes or and employee surveys allow you to report to the executive of mm. the company so i was 26 years old a 26 year old female and my work got me right into the boardroom of massive corporations wow. from the very first month that I was working. So that was really exciting. So I spent about six years there, eventually leading the measurement practice for Canada and had a blast with that. But at some point, the work was it was too much just people and it wasn't enough business. Um, and so I moved to another company 
that allowed me to not only facilitate people issues, but also business strategy. Mm. And so that was the addition there. And that's where I moved to Knightsbridge and Mm. met some of the people who will be my best friends and colleagues forever. (laughs) I had 10 amazing years at Knightsbridge, which then became part of LHH globally. Um, And 10 years was just amazing. But then uh, when Knightsbridge was sold, I decided that was my big chance Mm. to start my own company. And my husband and I just said, all right, let's do it. And so about six and a half years ago, we started Three Co's. So that's been my path. Only three places, six years at uh, Watson Y, 10 years at uh, at Knightsbridge, more than 10 years at Knightsbridge, uh, and then now six and a half years uh, at Three Co's. Wow. Congratulations for the six and a half years at your own company for, uh, first. And then, uh, but let us yeah. bring, bring you back to when you were 26 years old. And when you first started with What's and Why, right? And then you say that you would want to buy access to executive, to leaders, yeah. all right? And yeah. Yeah. at the age of 26, and then sitting in the, in the, off, in the ballroom with all the male and female in suit, it's not easy. No females. For, all males. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they, were, they were all. I was trying to make it, you know, a, a more diverse way anyway. But then, so let's uh, let's say it's, it's a room full of leaders who are male in suit. And for the 26 years old uh, lady like you to, to talk to them and to present and things like that, what courage gave you uh, to be able to, to do that? Because a lot of people, even if, you know, 40, 50 and very scary, uh, get into a room of business leaders though but it, yeah. back then you wanted it <laughs> i was just naive <laughs> I, just, I was ignorant i just i'm like i don't know i'm smart <laughs> they're lucky to have me uh, i think my parents um just did so much to raise me to be confident from the get-go graduate school was a great place to learn to have to defend your ideas and be be confident in your ideas mm. and then i had a mentor named terry mm. and she just believed in me from the very beginning mm. so we would go into those boardrooms together mm. and you know she would do most of the presentation but then a question would come from the executives about what was really going on or what this meant or that sort of thing. Mm. And Terry would just look at me and she wouldn't necessarily even say anything. Mm. She would just look at me and by guiding her eye contact toward me, Mm. she showed them, don't look at me, look at her. Ah. And her confidence in me, she was able to lend me her credibility. She was very senior. She had been an executive for a long time. She had a lot of credibility and a really nice blue suit with gold buttons. She did, she, she looked the part and, and her confidence in me, her looking to me just trained those clients that if you want the actual answers, don't look at me, look at her. She's the one who I get the presentation from. So that was worth everything to me. Wow. That was a lot of trust that she had put on you back then, uh, so that so that she gave you the full, you know, control on the on the room and on the environment, the atmosphere, and lead the conversation. Yeah. Wow. And then what after that? You know, when you get out of that room, what did you ask her? Why you stay? And you know, you lead your conversation to me. Did you ask her that? Just I didn't ask her. Uh-huh. I just she made it very clear Mm. that she knew that i had a good handle on the data i knew my stuff and like she just had confidence in me from the beginning and you know 24 years later we're still dear friends Uh, and and you know we also worked together at knightsbridge and so um yeah it was just she she believed in me Wow. And I therefore worked very hard never to let her down. <laughs> so you so, guys yeah. were an effective team. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Then when you move to Nightbridge and, uh, and then you get a very successful career there, went to very, very high level in organization, and then you took another big change in your life and then starting your, 
your, your own company with your husband. I think the part of starting the business with your loved one is beautiful. We really, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. I really enjoy it. Um, but then, you know, back then, <laughs> back then um, you know, what, what courage, what, what, you know, what gave you that drive to run the business? You no. Know, the biggest that, and, and it was a real turning point in my life. So my dad had, had been an entrepreneur for a long time mm. and he kept watching me in this company and he saw how hard I was working mm. and how much money I was bringing into the company wow. and how much less I was taking out of the company. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, how much work have you brought in? To the company i'm like well over a million dollars and how much do you get paid and so he just kept telling me you know start your own business have the freedom have the flexibility don't make somebody else rich make yourself rich what are you doing um and uh and he passed away uh in july of 2015 and he had a stroke and so i was able to communicate with him for a couple of days before he died and the last thing i ever said to my dad was i'm quitting i'm starting my own business and it, it like it almost makes me cry to think about it now because he was starting to cry in that moment he couldn't really speak much but he just he, he grabbed my hand he squeezed my hand he's like good <laughs> and so uh that was he died on the Friday. Uh, I quit Knightsbridge on Monday. <laughs> I was like, okay, sorry, I can't let my dad down. Got, gotta go. <laughs> wow. And so I've always felt uh, from the very beginning that we have a, you know, a, a guardian angel in this business. Um, I know he would be so proud of us. Uh, I just know he would just be crazy proud of us for what we've accomplished so there was a very obvious turning point for me there and and you know to be fair i was kind of getting to that point because knightsbridge had been acquired it was no longer this sort of small scrappy company it was now going to be part of a very large global company and that didn't appeal to me mm -hmm. so I, it was already starting to go but with my dad it was like okay now it's very clear mm -hmm. We sorry to brought you back into that, uh, you know, sensitive story, but uh, no, all good, all good. I feel like uh, uh, he had an amazing, amazing life. He lived eighty six years. He was he was very ready, uh, and so I feel very lucky. There, there's no sadness uh, mm. when I talk about my dad. It's just I feel so fortunate that I had the most amazing dad in the world, and I feel very fortunate that we have a one ghost board member mm -hmm. in this company <laughs> who's uh, who's watching out for us. What what he did so was with the new yes, company, sorry. yeah, with the new company Trico. Would you please uh, share with us about the meaning behind and how oh, you choose yeah, that three? Uh, that's a great question. So very soon after. Um, we decided to take my mom uh, and go uh, on a trip and we went to my husband's parents house they live in Montreal in Canada and we were we had decided okay we're starting our own company and we were sitting around the table Craig and my mom and me and we were trying to come up with a name for the company <laughs> and we didn't have a name all we had was a was a mission we knew what we wanted to do and what we wanted to do was to transform the way people communicate and connect and contribute so that they can achieve amazing things together. So all we had was this mission statement. And so we're sitting around the table. Craig was playing guitar. I had a big piece of paper where I was taking notes. And my mom was on the iPad uh, looking at available uh, web domains mm. and what was available. So I would say, well, what about, you know, connect is such an important word. And so I would throw out things. What about Connexus? And then my mom would look it up and she'd say, no, that's the name of a big church. Like, okay. What about such and such? And Craig would say, that sounds like a, a pharmaceutical, like that's, that's not good. <laughs> and so at some point I got really frustrated and I just said, like, I just want something that plays off these three codes of communicate, connect, and contribute. And Craig just, he has such a dry sense of humor. He just goes, how about three codes? Mm. <laughs> I was like, there we go. And within about 30 seconds, my mom was on 
GoDaddy or what are these domains? And she's like, it's available. She <laughs> clicks it, sold. There we go. We have a we have a name. So what's funny is it turns out I love the name. I think Three Co's is a great name. Mm. Um, turns out there's no way in English to spell Three Co's so that people know how to say it. Mm. So sometimes people say, is it Three Cozy? Um, or and so we thought, could you spell it number three C O S? And then people are like three cause. <laughs> so we thought that was a liability for a while, but now it turns out that everyone asks, how do you say it? Mm. And that gives me a chance every time to tell them why our company exists, mm. to help people communicate and connect and contribute so they can achieve amazing things together. And so now I love that people don't know how to say it because then everybody hears the story and the name has meaning. Um, yeah, and, and when you see the logo, if you actually, the logo looks like a three, but if you turn it on its side, it's it's co. Mm. Um, and so I kind of love now that it, it, it makes you have to stop and explain because then people know what we're so passionate about instead of it just being a name. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. We didn't even know how to, uh, uh, you know, say the name correctly say it. at first i was like three c o z <laughs> and then i i told me to my i told to myself that just go ahead and ask uh, uh leanne yes. so it's best to ask leanne and then let her explain her baby with us so <laughs> yeah and now you know it has this hmm. silly story behind it but i quite like it well and then from the from the point where you have everything you know all the salary all the benefit with a an organization and then scrap everything so from the scratch right how that journey looks like for both of us too both <laughs> of us quit our jobs oh both of you okay. quit the job wow it's even double liability back then how did you guys start yeah. everything from scratch yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. um you know i i i did have a moment of thinking is this crazy what what are we doing both quitting our job um we had saved up six months worth of living expenses mm. so our plan was all right let's try mm. we have six months if at four months it's not looking good i'm employable we'll go find i'll go find a job somewhere else it's no problem mm. um so we went for it and what I really remember is uh, I had a former client who is now a very dear friend mm. and uh, sh we had worked with her in one company and she had moved to another company and she called and she said, can you come and help us at this new company? And uh, we scheduled to go and help her and do the session in, um, in California uh, at the campus, right beside the campus of Stanford University, beautiful place. That was the very first day of Three Co's, oh. day one, October 1st, oh. 2015. And the company was Sony PlayStation. And so I thought it's our very first day ever as a company. I am in California with the executive team of Sony PlayStation. I'm like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> it's gonna be fine <laughs> and uh and it has been fine it's been much more than fine ever since that very first day but that was a good place to celebrate the first day of three goes wow so you had your on the first day on the launching day of the company you had a chance to have your first client as well and you know in california stanford campus we can <laughs> you know do the facilitation for the uh, sony uh, sony playstation executive Wow, <laughs> that's no better gift for, for a starter, right? It, it was amazing, it was amazing. So yeah, um, and it's just been all over everywhere and so many cool experiences since then. So yeah, I'm very, very, very fortunate. Wow, uh, Leanne, I, I now would like to, to go into your, uh, your work, all right? And then I think a lot of my audience are executives, uh, uh, HR professionals, and they are working every day to to bring the best out of the teams, of the colleagues, the staff, yeah. right? And then the idea of Teamworks has been in the market for, I think, you know, since we were, you know, our ancestor a thousand years ago, trying yes. to work as a team. But then over <laughs> a thousand years like that, that's you know we're still not working well as team what was the reason 
<laughs> yeah. Any reason that you 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 found in your research now? Yeah. So uh, a, a couple of reasons. So I would say we categorize it into two main categories. Mm. The first is that we we don't have a shared view of what matters most. Mm. We're not aligned, and so we aren't clear on what we're all here to do we aren't clear on what's our strategy and how do we need to think differently about things we are terrible at prioritizing so that we can actually have a focus so there's a whole category around uh, we don't spend enough time making sure the individuals on a team are aligned or that that team of individuals is aligned to the next team over in a different department so there's a lot around better alignment helping us know what to pay attention to that half of it the other half of it is about the interpersonal dynamics mm. so uh, we don't have sufficient trust uh, we and when we don't trust one another we aren't candid with one another we don't communicate we don't connect uh, we don't and interestingly a lot of my work is that people think uh, the biggest risk on teams is that is that conflict is the biggest risk. And what I say is a lack of conflict is a big risk because we, we play it safe, we don't innovate, we don't spot risks, we don't do a lot of things that are really important because we don't trust one another to say uncomfortable things. And so that dynamic around, I'm trying to protect myself, I don't know if this person is safe, um, I don't know if I can say what needs to be said, all of that half as well. So our work, what I adore about our work is that we go after both pieces. So mm. in facilitating strategy with a with an executive team, we're getting very clear on what matters most, uh, what we need to ruthlessly prioritize and even more ruthlessly deprioritize. So all of that side, what what is our role clarity? How do we add value that's unique from one another mm. and we go after the that's the grow up part Vivian <laughs> we go after the you know people behaving in a way that's self protective um, that's uh, really not having conflict in a healthy constructive way mm. so I love that three Co's brings those two sides of things together mm. the, the the side that business uh, functioning in silos is is very uh, very easy for us to see on a daily basis. Every company that I, I came there, and I, I we still hear story. We, we you know we heard about you know managers or directors talk about my team, but you know, and then the agenda of my team, but not the you know the collaboration between inter teams, right? So that part we heard, but the part that you say the first piece is that the alignment. Um, uh, you know, like uh, the role, the responsibility, the communication, everything. Yeah. Uh, that part is pretty surprised to me. I thought that, you know, the more that we organize, the more co uh, organizations uh, evolve, you know, those supposed to be, uh, you, know, all, you know, when we're on board, we already got a job description, everything should be clear in there. But reality is not to you. Can you share some? No, some? not at yeah. all. Not at all. So I'm working with a team right now, mm. as an example, a big um, professional services team, and they are organized into what I would call practices, like the, each practice does different things. So I, I won't give you the exact examples from this company just mm. to protect their, but let's let's take a, an example of an accounting firm because a lot of us understand accounting firms. Yes. So they have the audit practice that, you know, they have a very clear role. They audit companies um, for assurance and to make sure our markets are all operating. They have a tax practice and then they all usually have a consulting practice. Mm. And so, you know, those are the silos, right? And, and, what those silos help to do is to get deep technical experts and process efficiency in what because the way auditors work is very very different from the way consultants work mm -hmm. so if we want to hire the best and develop them and 
and do methodology work and all those sorts of things, it makes sense to organize so that our organization verticals, mm -hmm. reporting relationships are differentiated by the work you do. Like at, at LHH, it would be career transition people versus leadership people, very different mm -hmm. work that they do. Um, then they say, okay, but what's happening is in a region, so in Asia Pacific, you know, there are clients who don't want to think about it as audit and tax and advisory. They, the clients just want to know, I have a relationship with ABC company. Mm. I expect everybody at ABC company knows who I am and what my company is about. And that's where we start to run into problems. So you might say, we're going to have a regional structure as well, or a client structure. It's as soon as we add anything more complex than a straight line, mm. like I know my boss and I know my direct reports, humans are really good at that. We know how to do that. Mm. We can have control and we, like, we're good at that. We know how to do power relationships pretty effectively. But as soon as you say, okay, well, you don't have power over these people, but you need to have influence mm. and you need to, as soon as you add any kind of matrix organization, <clears throat> <laughs> people go nuts they're like what do you mean I can't just control this or say this or do this or I don't own this decision you're like well <laughs> and so because organizations are becoming so global so large so multifaceted there are almost no organizations we deal with now that don't have some form of matrix mm. and that's where all of our models break down our human behavior and desire to feel that the world is predictable and controllable is out the window. Mm. So that's why I think Three Co's is very busy. Mm. <laughs> is that companies now all have to wrestle with this. And so this firm that we're working with right now, they've added this regional model. Mm. But what's happening is the regional people are just trying to be helpful and add value, but they're kind of adding value on the wrong stuff. And so they're mucking around in stuff that doesn't need help, which is creating defensiveness from the other people. And like it's messy mm. and it's not messy because they're bad people or the, the primary issue is not a trust issue. The primary issue is we haven't been clear about how we each have very unique value if we all focus on adding the value that is uniquely ours, it'll be great, mm. but let's not step on one another and overstep because that's where it's going to really create a lot of friction. So those alignment conversations, I'm having those all day, every day. <laughs> and, and if you solve those, it's amazing how many of the things that manifested as trust issues that mm. people thought were trust issues were not trust issues at all they were alignment issues and once we're all clear on what's most important what's less important who makes what decisions once we're clear on that it doesn't feel like uh, a trust problem at all anymore leanne all of the people in the ballroom is uh, 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 director manager they're all very smart people you know so they earn the, the you know the title they earn them the the privilege to sit in the room right but what what blind you know what make them be blinded about you know those things that that uh, that cannot you know break the silos and create the harmonized environment and if you say it's not the trust issue but so what 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 was there to be the major issue then though yeah i think often it's because first of all the people who rise to those very senior levels are are type a people very performance driven somebody in a session i did last week in austin referred to them as coin operated as if it's just like tell me what you're gonna pay me for and i'll do that mm. and Unfortunately, our measurement systems, for the most part, are very differentiated between different people. So they're like, look, I'm not paid for that, so I'm not going to worry about it. So they, what they are paid for, they're very controlling about, and they may overstep, and they may force, and that's not pretty. And things that they aren't paid for, they pay way too little attention to, and they aren't helpful with. So. I think we have a lot of coin operated leaders 
and 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 you know it's it's just kooky to think that people would be anything different if you and even if it's not money even if they're just very performance oriented and ambitious and they want to perform well mm. companies have told them that performing well means your piece performing well so they do anything they can to make sure their piece performs well and you know who cares what happens to everybody else so uh, it's a failure of planning and measurement and rewards from the very top down and and i would say you know i get pretty frustrated even i've been writing this month on linkedin about strategy and the lack of strategy mm. and somebody just said well in a in a publicly traded company where every month and every quarter you're rewarded and and hounded and and look under a microscope at your results how could we expect anybody to be strategic so i think not even just within the company are we measuring and rewarding the wrong behaviors but as an economy we're measuring and rewarding the wrong behaviors so mm. it it's not something that one poor leader can solve on their own mm. because it's a whole system that's really uh, measuring things for the benefit of the very short term and even in our society you know the kind of companies that we're rewarding are companies that are you know maybe good in the short term but doing long run damage and harm to our environment our communities our society so we've kind of got it all messed up mm. wow yeah so yeah that that make me curious so peak performance is something that obviously as the measurement um so through your uh you know through your company and helping the company uh for the teamwork yeah. what would be the additional value the leadership should be aware to rate uh, behind the uh, beside the performance yeah so it's, it's just reframing how we measure performance right and it's very hard because you know the the basic understanding of, of basic reward and how humans work is you want to reward people for things they have control over mm. so we we can't go so far in the direction of of like measuring them on one whole number that they feel they don't have any control and therefore it isn't helpful but we need to find better ways of moving more toward measures that uh, look at the whole i guess the other thing that i really despise is how much of our uh, measurement and reward system is on a yearly basis mm. so we set the performance goals and the smart goals at the beginning of the year and then we measure people on those at the end of the year but in the year that happens our world is not changing once a year mm. <laughs> um, so in that year that's happening things change in the market it means that we need to respond differently it means we're going to maybe change what projects we do but we've never changed the person's smart goals and so if they step back from something to support the performance of the whole organization they are punished mm. later for not achieving their goals so one of the things i think we need to do is make goals much more dynamic mm. much more iterative mm. when we make the decision as a team to say we're going to you know double down on this increase our investment here but we're going to starve this deprioritize it then you immediately go back to both of those people's smart goals and say well you're getting way more resources so we need to make your goals a little harder mm. and you're getting way fewer resources so we're going to change your goals they need to be alive and dynamic mm. otherwise all year this person is is somehow trying to get to their goal burn people out by trying to have them do it in their spare time not be all in on the thing you've decided is the most important opportunity or threat so you know if i could go after one thing mm -hmm. i would go after this annual goal setting and say that's not how business works <laughs> so why are we having this misalignment between how the humans are being 
you know, measured and, and how they're operating and what the business needs. It makes no, it makes no sense. <laughs> Leanne, and that led me to, um, that leads me to an, another point that we got so much discussion in many country, um, at least seven, eight years back when the reward system for countries that we put on top of that is their regional performance and then go to global performance so the piece of rewards is being cut into you know a lot more you know like structure and then so yeah. it's, it's really discouraged the country to perform because then if i perform really well but if the region is not performing what's the point and then if the region performed really well but globally is not performing uh, so what's the point? So I, so uh, and then during that time we did a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people who resign exit assessment, okay, exit interviews, yeah. and then and then when we when I asked the people who exit their organization, maybe just you know in the coffee time because those are not you know um, those are not the uh, the pay service that we receive. So it's just uh, on the hobby side that I like to do, and then. Uh, and then they say that um, you know organizations try to put a goal is very very big you know like one organization yeah. one mission one team one yeah. goal and everything but then uh, you know because of you know that is too bit of the ambition that you know when it divided down onto you know like um, category by region by divisions those collapse and the people don't see the leaders demonstrate you know their commitments toward a one team one mission and, and something like that uh, so they start to not happy at work because you know what's the point for if they go into work get paid but not being happy yeah. and then being sucked into those uh, politics those things that you know carry home unhappily and then and then and then when you're not home happy you're not gonna you know going home not happy you're not gonna go to work the next day happy, right? So, no. however, Vivian and I always believe that you know we as human beings we create problems, okay? But then we always have the intention to fix the problem and make things better. Okay? So, if an organization for somehow, somewhere, somewhat right now uh, that they don't have a good team work culture, all right? Yeah. And then, yeah. what would be the ve a few steps for leaders to uh, to spot out those and take actions, uh, and then yeah. to, to 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 reverse engineer the whole situation, though. Yeah. So we, you know, our process mm. is really uh, four steps. So uh, the first step, and and if it's not going well, people. Ought, well, this is a very North American statement, but in North America, uh, what we love to do when there's issues on our team is go do team building. Mm -hmm. Like we, we want to like, let's all go do some team building and let's, let's either like, let's go on some crazy cooking class together or, or let's all sit in a circle and talk about our feelings. Like they go straight to trying to fix the team dynamic. That's, a terrible move don't do that oh. um, the first thing you want to do is actually go back to what's changing in our world um, how is that affecting our industry and our company and in that changing world what is our company counting on us this team to do what what does it need to look like what do we need to pay more attention to what additional value do we need to add what's less important that that we used to do, but is not as important now. So starting with that question of what's our purpose as a team, mm. uh, and then to talk about, so therefore, what are the most important things we can be doing together? What do we have to pay attention to? What value do we need to create? So starting with conversations about how the outside world is and, and what's coming is changing what you need to pay attention to as a team. That's always our first conversation. Mm. People love it mm. because first of all, it's not scary. Mm. It, it doesn't feel like someone's going to tell everybody that you're a, you're rude. And you know, instead it's like, okay, we can have this conversation. But as you have that conversation and you say to the team, okay, if that's what the organization is counting on you to do, then, you know, 
how's it going? How much of your time are you spending on that? That sort of thing. And usually they'll be like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's not what we're doing. At all. <laughs> that's not how we're spending our time. So that's great because we can do this course correction. Mm. So, um, <laughs> you know, that's super useful. And then the second stage we go to is we use a personality assessment tool yeah. to help each individual understand themselves better, become that's a bit of that grow up as well, um, help them understand themselves better, understand what they need. And, and in some cases, how those needs aren't being met, uh, understand one another and where they might be experiencing what is just a different way of thinking and, and valuable and productive, but they may be experiencing it as friction. So the second stage we go to is a deep understanding of each individual, but also looking at that together to say, okay, if we go back to what we said in the first session about what everyone's counting on us to do, and if we look at our natural cognitive styles, which of those things are going to come easily mm. and which are we going to neglect and which are going to be difficult. Mm. And so we go there next mm. um, and then we get into talking about behavior. Then we have the hard conversation. So that's how we approach it. Always starting with the business purpose of the team, mm. then moving to insight about oneself and, and your teammates. Mm. And then we can get into talking about behavior. So that's the approach that we really recommend. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. We're not going to go further on that one because that's the way uh, Cozy is working for your clients. So, and then we are not going to go on that. <laughs> and um, one thing I, um, my audience is really interested in to, uh, to hear from you is, um, um, you know, when we were young, our parents always tell us, hey, stay away from conflict. If there's conflicts, try to, you know, stay outside of that and not involved. But then your book, you wrote about you, the, the good fight. Yeah. <laughs> no, conflict is important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that goes against the whole thing that I've been taught when I was young and then how many of my people in the region here were taught when we were young also uh, as stay away from conflict. So how did that happen yes. in your research? I, I think people, people in Canada and people in Vietnam Absolutely. We were taught the same thing. So yeah. we're, we're with you on this one. So what happens is organizations require conflict. Mm. Conflict is this, we have to take too few resources mm. and try and make them go very far. And that's always going to require hard trade-offs. Mm. We're going to have to make difficult choices about what we do and what we don't do. That requires conflict. Mm. We want to innovate and innovation requires the willingness to have conflict with the status quo, with mm. where we are today. Mm. We have to look at someone's work and spot assumptions and risks mm. that requires conflict. We have to give one another feedback to help ourselves grow that requires conflict. So we've been taught that conflict is uh, not for nice people. Mm -hmm. It's impolite, it's unprofessional, it's not ladylike for women. And it's getting us into all sorts of trouble because that causes us to get into what I call conflict debt, mm -hmm. where we are getting piled under debt mm -hmm. in all the issues we should be talking about, mm -hmm. but we aren't. Mm -hmm. And that's hurting us, causing stress for us as individuals. It's eroding trust on our teams and it's stalling our companies. So the way I talk about it instead is some things are worth fighting for. Mm. So how do we set the boundaries to, to make sure conflict is, 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 is good and, and it should yeah. be promoted and then everybody needs to open more open to you know to hear to accept embrace it though yeah i've, I've written a lot about this mm. because there is a difference between productive conflict which i um i describe as tension mm. something that's stretching us and making us bigger and it's uncomfortable it's mm. like oh but it's it's a growth discomfort mm. versus friction mm. which is wearing me down and hurting me. And so productive conflict is focused on the issues. It has, there is a lot of listening. It's you 
raising questions to open up, you know, what would this look like? For, you know, we hear this all the time of very uh, US centric companies and other people saying, okay, but how would this land in Asia Pacific? Mm. You know, how, but that's a question to stretch somebody to be like, oh, I never thought about Asia Pacific. Mm. Um, so there, you know, productive conflict is open questioning, listening, you know, unproductive conflict is protective, um, defending, pulling back, it's personal. Um, so, you know, it's really important. And I, I write a lot about how do we get more of the productive That's kind of conflict, this tension, and a lot less of the unproductive friction that wears us, wears us down. Wow. Thank you so much, Leanne. I have two more questions for you. Okay. Okay. Two last. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, is about teamwork, and it's again is is your area of, of love. And then we have a lot of new kid on the block and teams. Okay. And then you know the young generations, and you know a lot, you know the workforce a lot younger. And then teams now is so dynamic compared to ten years ago, and the expectation, everything's changed. So there's a lot of things for leaders need to learn and unlearn, but there's a lot of things for newbies to come and need to learn and adapt also. So where do you see yeah. teamwork's challenges in the next couple of years to be for, for, for managers, for leaders, so that we need to learn something new, we unlearn something that's not productive, and relearn something yeah. that can be create an environment to promote? So it, people really overplay the generational differences like there's not that much evidence okay. for major generational differences but if there are some minor differences it's that young people um, expect to be respected mm. in the workplace it's not that baby boomers didn't also want to be respected but they put up with not being respected mm -hmm. and having to persevere and and you know earn the right and earn seniority mm -hmm. young people don't have to mm -hmm. anymore they can be like oh okay you're not showing me respect you don't value me i'm gonna go somewhere else so mm -hmm. that's the only difference it's not that we don't all no matter how old we are want to be respected it's just some of us were socialized and taught that even if we weren't we had to stay um, and, and now that's a very different socialization. So I think learning how to learn from one another, regardless of age or technical expertise, I think the biggest thing we have to do is get out of this, some people are better or more valuable than others, and get into a, a thinking of, I can learn from absolutely everybody, and mm -hmm. I'm gonna go actively try and do that. So that's one. Mm -hmm. The big one that I'm most worried about for teams is how many teams are now going to be in a hybrid mode where sometimes and some people will be physically together in an office and other people will be remote. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been putting a lot of my energy onto is how psychologically we're going to have a very uneven playing field between people who are physically together mm. and those who are not. Mm. And so the team dynamics that come from that is something I've been worrying a lot about. Wow. Well, that leads me to the next question, which is the last for today also. Uh, so we've been understanding your, pa your past, the present that you do, and then we're always exciting to know what the future is look like. Uh, uh, and is there any exciting things you're working on, Leanne, that you want to have a sneak show for us in the audience to to <laughs> to expect what to come? <laughs> yeah, I guess you know the mode that I'm in now is really trying to serve, to serve, mm -hmm. um, to be joyous and generous in mm -hmm. the world, and so. Uh, thing is that I've been making a concerted effort on LinkedIn to be generous, to share ideas and tools. And so I'm so excited about that. And I launched a newsletter on LinkedIn where only once a month, because I don't want to hurt people's inboxes, but once a month, I send a newsletter on one specific topic with multiple articles. In every newsletter, there's a free downloadable tool. I I highlight, you know, other people who are doing cool work in this area. So 
uh, I'm really excited about. So my goal is to make my LinkedIn the coolest couch on the internet mm. to have the most important conversations we need to have uh, about work. So that's really exciting. And what's happening is then each month as I go very deeply into the research and advice and tools on one topic, I'm creating on leandavy.com these resource sort of super guides for people. So the first one should be out today um, uh, on toxic work environments. And so it's everything fully accessible. You don't need anything to access it, but it's, you know, videos, tools, resources, exercises, everything really, really like meaty on topics like toxic work environments, conflict, better meetings, strategy. So I'm so excited about trying to take all the 32 years of organizational psychology that are in here and to just share it for free with everyone um, everywhere. So I'm so excited about that. And, and, and people just uh, the feedback from people about, you know, why are you giving this away for free? And I, this is amazing. It, it's so awesome. I love it. So yeah, watch leandavy.com. And if, if any of your viewers uh, use LinkedIn, send me a connection request. Uh, I would and subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, I try and only make it just once a month and the most juicy, valuable, good stuff um, because I'm so excited about that. Wow. Thank you so much. How amazing. The next time that we are having uh, the HR committee meeting in Vietnam, I will share, you know, the website to the HR professionals here. Thank so that you. They can pass out to to the college and their subcommittees in here. Liana, you've been doing wonderful, yeah. wonderful things. And, uh, and we really admire what you do. We really admire you individually. And uh, so we would like to say uh, thank you for, for spending your time with us and with the audience. Uh, and uh, we wish you, your family, great, right? And we wish you, yes. you all, um, the, all the best in this life, okay? And I look forward to uh, to sometime being able to give you a big hug in Vietnam because I need to come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Thank you very much. But then, when you come, <laughs> let me and Vivian know. So we would be so excited Absolutely. to take you guys around. And if you're ever in Toronto, let me know. Absolutely. <laughs> so, Leanne, have a wonderful day there. Thank you so much. Cool. And tell people there we say hello, all right? Absolutely. And good night to you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good day, yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.